Please join me for our call to worship from Psalm 33. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Our hymn of praise is hymn number 35, I'll Praise My Maker. Please stand as we sing.
soon. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you have sent the spirit of your Son into our hearts and freed us from bondage to sin. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service that we and all people may be brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. To all those gathered in this place who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. It's my great joy and privilege to welcome you to worship here at First Baptist Church of West Point. Both those of you who are able to gather together here this morning in our sanctuary and those of you who are joining us online. Wherever you are, I hope that you have prepared your hearts and your minds to worship the living God this morning. And let's continue in that worship by standing and singing hymn number 454, God our Father, you have led us. You please stand. lesson from Psalms is a, from the book of Psalms is a small portion of Psalm 119 verses 81 through 96. My soul longs for your salvation, I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise, I asked, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wine skin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your laws. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life, that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day. For all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. 
I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. The, the wicked lie and wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. And now let's stand and sing hymn 262, Word of God Across the Ages. Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 that sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death has spread to us all because all have sinned. But he also assures us in that same chapter that while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So trusting in the death of Jesus to atone for our sin and trusting in the resurrection of Christ Jesus to make us alive in him, let us approach the throne of God for mercy in time of need. Let us confess our sins, sisters and brothers, before God and one another, first silently and then with a prayer of confession that I'll provide. Let's pray. Almighty God, you poured your spirit upon gathered disciples on the day of Pentecost, creating bold tongues and open ears and a community of faith. We confess that we have grieved your Holy Spirit, by whom we are indeed sealed for the day of redemption, because we have not listened for your word of grace in Christ Jesus. We have not spoken the gospel of your love in Christ Jesus. We have not lived as a people 
made one in Christ Jesus. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your Spirit and fill us with a fervent desire to be your people, doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Beloved, hear now the good news of the gospel from Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It is by faith in Jesus Christ that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, having reminded ourselves of our forgiveness in Jesus Christ, Let's also remind ourselves of God's will for our lives. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In response to this, let's stand and sing, and sing hymn number 406, The Solid Rock. You may be seated. So we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed. Let us turn again to God in prayer. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 9 to 19. 
Listen carefully. This is God's word. When they, when they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on top of the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and, because, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear now the word of the Lord from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, the first chapter, beginning with the eighth verse. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. Without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's stand for the reading of the gospel. This is from the gospel according to Luke. The first chapter, the song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, 
to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. In our uh, modern advances, we now have this miraculous way in which you can send off and get in the mail a little swab or a little vial that you can spit into and ship off somewhere. And in a few weeks, you will get this report that tells you all about your genetic makeup, who you are, and your connection to mm, thousands of other people. Some living, perhaps, if you're into one of those genealogy things that will uh, connect you with, with other folks or maybe even going back hundreds of years, connecting you to, to your ethnic ancestors, wherever they may be from. It's the kind of information that can change your life, can maybe change your perception of yourself. It reflects a reality about your, your body, about what's going on. I mean, here you'll get on a page some words. And if you dig a little deeper, you'll see a, a breakdown that is a strange combination of just a few letters and a bunch of numbers. But somehow it is a representation of what is the reality of who you are genetically. Words on a page, but they can have a great implication for your life. I mean, look, some people look at that and it's rather inconsequential. Like, uh-huh, whatever. But for others, not only their lives, but the lives of their families have been turned upside down. Infidelities have been exposed. And at other times, mix-ups. Mix-ups at fertility clinics and mix-ups at hospitals where people have realized, whoops, I got swapped with somebody else. Simple words that come back representing something that is alive in you that can shape the way that you live and understand yourself. Well, how accurate those are is somewhat debatable. That's just a DNA test. But what about an eternal word? How does the word of God shape your life? Well, we get a glimpse of the life of Paul, and particularly his prayer life, his everyday prayer life, in the short section of the letter to the Romans that we've read this morning. Here the Apostle Paul lets us see some of the ways in which the Word of God, the promises of God, affected how he lived and how he prayed day in, day out. And the very first thing that we note right off from the get-go is that it brought about thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for Paul. He was thankful for promises fulfilled. He gives thanks for the faith that the Romans have in Christ Jesus. Now, this part of the letter is in truth a kind of typical part of a letter. I mean, it's typical for Paul. When we look at Paul's writings, he kind of tells people who he is, who he's writing to, and then he gives this prayer that often involves thanksgiving. But in fact, we know that other letters in this time period, just like our letters have certain forms they take, it was not uncommon in the Greco-Roman world of this time for people to have a, a kind of thankfulness or a prayer that was mentioned to some deity. Well, that's not unusual, 
But what is telling is what Paul has to say and how he says it in this section. He is thankful, but he is not thankful to the Romans. He is, in fact, thankful to God. Thankful to God for the faith that the Romans exercise. Now, this is a little side note from where we're going, but it, in fact, gives us a very clear implication of something that Paul will unpack later in this, in this letter, particularly when we get closer to chapters 8 and 9. The implication is that faith itself is not the product of apostolic work. Faith is not due to the piety of the Romans. They weren't some great people of, of, of piety. In fact, that's not even true of us. We don't have faith because of our piety. What Paul is implying here is that faith itself is a gift from God. It comes from the internal work of the Holy Spirit upon the hearer of the gospel. And so Paul is thankful to God for the faith that the Romans exercise in Christ Jesus. Now an apparent driving motivation for that or I think more likely a critical component of his thanksgiving is that in fact this faith that the Romans are exercising is right now being proclaimed throughout the world. In all the world. Now that's a bit of a hyperbole we know, right? I mean there were plenty of Native Americans running around these parts who never heard anything about the Romans. But Far and wide in the Mediterranean world, in that area that, that Paul and everyone else knew, word had gotten out. There are Christians in the city of Rome. In the shadow of the emperor, there are those who profess faith in Christ. Where people had heard of Rome, they had begun to hear of this word. It would have been an encouragement to numerous of Christians, of churches that gathered throughout the empire. It's an astounding thing. And the cracks, the tiny little cracks under the, the throne of the emperor, the seeds of the gospel had begun to sprout. Now, I said, though, that this is Paul, in fact, giving thanks for promises fulfilled. And so the question really is, well, what promise is being fulfilled? Well, certainly there are things that Jesus said that are being fulfilled right now in Rome. We can think of those final words that are recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Where it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Well, maybe it hadn't quite made it to the end of the earth, but it's about halfway at this point to the known end of the western world that, that they knew. And Paul has goals of getting to the very end there that they knew, to, to Spain. So something that Christ had said was being fulfilled, or we might think of those words that I really like from Romans chapter 10 verse 16 where Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, not a part of, of the tribe of the people of Israel. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock and one shepherd. Well, the word of Christ is being fulfilled. He has sheep there even in Rome and they have been brought in and more are being brought in still. Or we could think of Jesus' words that Matthew records in chapter 28 before he ascends into heaven there. Jesus said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In light of that, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Well, in some way, that promise and that word of the authority of Christ was being exercised. But I think, particularly in light of how some other things that we know about Paul, some things that we've seen in Paul's letter to the Galatians, and that he will even unpack here to the letter of the Romans, I think Paul, in fact, has a much older promise in mind. A promise that we read. Genesis chapter 22, there is Abraham has been obedient to the word of God and has offered Isaac. And the angel of the Lord has stayed his hand. And the substitute has been offered in his place. But God reiterated a promise that he had made and, and gives it even, fleshes out even more here. God says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now those words were spoken a long time ago. And an offspring, a particular offspring of Abraham would be the means through which the nations would be blessed. And the gate of his enemies he would possess. There's sort of two aspects of this promise, aren't there? And they, I think they're both being fulfilled in some way there in Rome. It's very much in line with how Zechariah saw the promise of God being fulfilled there as, as his, his miraculous son John was born and what he knew that John would be leading, preparing the way for. When he says and praises God to show the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Paul is giving thanks because God has fulfilled a promise, a promise made to Abraham. Now Paul witnesses the nations being blessed all the way to the very heart of the empire. Those who put Christ Jesus to death, who in some way reflect, maybe not the greatest enemy, but something of an enemy to the people of God. But there in the heart of the empire, there are those who profess the name of Christ. Thanksgiving is an essential part of the Christian life. And here, Paul models an important part of this thanksgiving in the life of faith. He shows us that we are to keep our eyes peeled for the fulfillment of God's word and in turn we are to give thanks for what we see. As the, the spread of the gospel, the, the unfolding development of the kingdom of God, we witness, we should give thanks we should give thanks because the promise that God swore to Abraham is still being fulfilled in our day. But even in our own lives, we see God's word being fulfilled. We too are a part of that unfolding, unfolding spread of the kingdom. But even we know the promises of Christ's presence, his abiding love. We should give thanks accordingly. But we also see that not only does Paul give thanks for what he sees as God's word fulfilled, God's promises fulfilled, but he also prays in accordance with the word of God. In verses 9 through 12, Paul prays, I think, as a Christian and as an apostle. As the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul had a special commission to those who, who were outside the, the Jewish Fold. He had a special commission to Gentiles. And there in the church of Rome, there were Gentiles, and the church of Rome would have fallen under that commission. 
And so he in many ways prays here as an apostle, an apostle to the Gentiles. But I think he also prays simply as a fellow believer, a brother in Christ. He longed to see the Roman Christians. That is, he longed to share in fellowship with them. They belonged to Christ. He belonged to Christ. They had something in common. And furthermore, he seeks to strengthen them in their faith and to be strengthened by them. So here Paul is praying in accordance with the word of God. Well, what word is that? Well, I think we might think of, we could say something like Jesus' simple commandment that he gives when he says, a new commandment I give you. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. There is a love for these Roman Christians. A love in Christ. And Paul prays that he might have opportunity to express that love to them. But also in John where Jesus speaks of, of the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper might rejoice together. In many ways Paul is praying in accordance with that word. He wants to go and he wants to to, to sow the seeds of the gospel among those Romans, that a harvest might be reaped, that they might both be encouraged, that new converts might come into to the fellowship, but also that they might be encouraged and strengthened by one another in the very words that they share. All of us are given spiritual gifts, gifts that are to be used in the kingdom of God, in the household of faith. We sow, we reap. Paul prays for the opportunity to fulfill this, to fulfill his calling, to fulfill this very word of Christ, fulfill it among the Romans, and he prays that they too might be, be able to fulfill, fulfill that word in his life. In this way, Paul is in fact following the example of Jesus. In Luke 22, we have... Some words that Jesus spoke to Simon Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Something similar in the very ideas of what Paul is praying that they might be strengthened by one another, that their faith might grow. When we know that God keeps his word, and that his word is effectual in the lives of his children, we pray in accordance with that word. Augustine, in his confessions, said this, My entire hope my entire hope is exclusively in your very great mercy. Grant what you command, command what you will. Grant what you command and command what you will. This is Augustine's prayer to God. My only hope is in your great mercy. But God, grant what you command. Command what you will. We know the commandments of God. We pray in accordance with those that those commandments might be fulfilled in us. I mentioned that faith is a gift from God. And like faith, love is itself also a gift from God. We cannot generate within ourselves the full expression of love with which Jesus has loved us. And yet he tells us, love one another just as I have loved you. Well, if we can't do that by our own strength, what hope do we have? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can in fact do that within us. And so we pray accordingly. Command what you will, but grant what you command. Work within us this great love. 
Paul knows the word. He knows the word that God has spoken. He looks out and he sees opportunities for that word to be fulfilled in his life and in the life of others. And so he prays. He prays for the fulfillment of God's word in his life and in the life of the Romans. This too is how we should pray. But this leads to a third aspect of Paul's life and his prayer life. And that is hope. Hoping in God's word. Hoping in God's promises. Paul's prayers and his intentions convey this hope. He knew that his calling was to carry the name of Jesus to the Gentiles. He knew that Jesus would in fact accomplish this purpose, this calling, through him. Through his obedient actions. And so... In his own life, Paul cultivated hope. The hope that he had in Christ. In verse 10, a part of his consistent prayers is that he might make his way to Rome. That's a hope that Paul has. I'm, I'm hoping, I yearn to make it to Rome. In verse 13, we learn that he, that he had had these intentions, perhaps that he had had plans to go on numerous occasions. But he had been prevented each and every time. The hope had been deferred. After so many attempts, perhaps he would despair of ever reaching them. Maybe it was time to change the goal, perhaps. But instead, Paul prayed with hope. He kept praying. A hope that rested on the power and the will of God to accomplish the task that, that had, had been given given to Paul despite the shifting circumstances. Circumstances change, God, but your commission is not. And so I pray in hope. I pray in hope that this opportunity to fulfill the call might come to fruition. But this hope gets more complicated by some facts that we learn in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 21, Paul has been trying to make his way back to Jerusalem. He has a stay in Caesarea with Philip the Evangelist. And we read in chapter 21 that a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Luke says, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Don't go, Paul. This is bad news. And Paul answered, what are you doing? <laughs> Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, it looks like at that point, huh, I'll never make it to Rome. I may rot in a jail or die in Jerusalem. The Spirit has spoken, but I am ready. <laughs> Turns out, these bad things do happen to Paul, but they are in fact the way in which he gets to Rome. He can make an appeal. He's a Roman citizen. And so he goes to Rome as a prisoner, facing the possibility of execution. He has been praying and praying for the ability to visit these Christians in Rome, to preach the gospel there. And he goes bound in chains. It looks like Jerusalem itself would be a dead end. And yet he goes there with hope. And that hope gets him to Rome. But how in the world does Paul do this? How in the world can Paul say to these brothers and sisters who are saying, Don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. I'm ready. Must have been a great, courageous man. Well, yeah, I, I suspect there's some courage there. 
But more so, it is hope. Hope. I think something C.S. Lewis wrote helps us understand this a little bit more. Lewis wrote, hope is one of the theological virtues. Faith, hope, and love. Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking. No. But one of the things a Christian is meant to do. You get that? Looking forward to heaven is something a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves. Those who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire. The great men who built up the Middle Ages. The English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. Seems to me that's sort of the way we pray, isn't it? That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lewis continues, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Brothers and sisters, let us cultivate hope hope in the promises that we have in Christ Jesus. Let us aim at heaven. Let us set our minds on heaven, realizing that there, as we contemplate this, as we think of the assurances that Christ has get, given us, that there he has prepared a place for us. There is where we will be with him. If that is your aim, then the obstacles, the setbacks, the heartaches, and the pains of this world will never be dead ends. For they will never be your intended destination, will they? Mm -mm. They're just stones on the path. For you are aiming at heaven. The final aspect that we see here is the fulfilling of the obligations that are related to God's promises. Paul ends this prayer section and lays the groundwork for the next thought with, with this sentence. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. The promises God fulfilled in Paul's life, the prayers that he prayed and the hope that he lived in meant that there were obligations on his life. He was obliged to preach the gospel to the Gentiles of all walks of life. To the, to the civilized Greek, to the barbarian, to the people who were wise and to the foolish people. This is true of us as well. Faith, hope, and love are indeed gifts from God. But all of the things that God has prepared beforehand for us to walk in like those, we must walk in them. Faith may be a gift, but it is you who must believe. Hope is a gift from God, but you have to be the one who hopes. You must love. But you cannot do it apart from God. In these gifts, you cannot be inert, thinking, well, if it's going to get from God, it's just going to happen. No, you must exercise them. We are indeed under obligation, an obligation to believe, to hope, to love, to share the good news. Because 
God's word is not something that we simply live in light of. But if we are in Christ, then his word lives in us. This is not what Jesus said. If you abide, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is, in fact, how Paul prayed. Thanking God for his word fulfilled. Praying that that word would be fulfilled in his own life still. Living in the hope of its certain fulfillment. And thus fulfilling the obligation of the very things for which he had prayed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's take a moment and reflect on these words. Reflect on how it is we will live in light of them. The things that we have seen Paul do in this letter are they things that we will in fact engage in in our own lives of faith. We continue to respond to God's word. Let us do so by affirming our faith together, the very content of what we believe. Let's stand. Say the words of the creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 335, Standing on the Promises.
Okay, I'll remind you of a few a few things. Uh, next Sunday, we'll have a deacons meeting along with the finance committee. We'll meet after Sunday school, um, so I hope you can attend that meeting if you are part of the deacons or the finance committee. And then um, today, young people will be meeting out at the dam, two o'clock. Um, and and I want to make mention of something that's going to happen in a not this week, but the next. And that is on Thursday, February 24th, uh, Point University will be having a concert here in, in our sanctuary. And that will start at 7 o'clock. And so I would encourage you to, to come out for that and to invite, invite some folks to, to join in and enjoy the, um, I mean, it's like the entire fine arts department almost uh, who will be, uh, putting on this concert. So um, I encourage you to, to avail yourself of that opportunity. Um, any other announcements? Uh, stewards of Children training tonight at the Presbyterian Church from 5 to 7. Okay. St um, stewards of Children training Presbyterian Church tonight 5 to 7. In Davis Hall? In Davis Hall. In Davis Hall. All right. All right. Um, let's. If you have any prayer requests, you have any praises or requests that you would like to make known at this time. Well. Excellent. So Jana, recovering from her her fall and subsequent surgery. We want to avoid war in Ukraine. Yes, we do want to continue to pray for the situation in Ukraine. Okay, so uh, uh, you want to share a name, Donnie? Fa okay, uh, so a, a family, a family of a, one of Donnie's. Sorry, back up. Uh, Donnie has a friend who passed away. We're gonna, we want to remember their family. Pray for Margaret with her eye situation. Okay. Margaret Bartlett and her eyes. Oh, yes, the the this uh, outbreak that we've been in. We do want to pray for its continued decline. No. <laughs> now pray to a so I'm sorry, that was Su Suzette, uh, Linda's daughter, will be having knee replacement March 23rd. Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you as a thankful people. We thank you, Father, that you've made us in your image. And that as your image bears, we are, we are called to be a royal priesthood. And in Christ, we are that. And so we come before you now, Father, interceding on behalf of, of one another of our friends and family, for our community, our state and nation, and our world. We praise you and we thank you for your, your faithfulness, for the healing that you have brought to Jana, and we pray for her continued strength. Uh, thank you, Father, for the progress of my mother, and we ask the same for her, for continued healing. We thank you, Father, that we too see the fulfillment of your word as, as even today there are those around the world who, who have heard the gospel, those who have placed their faith in Christ and who have followed him in baptism. And we rejoice in this. For this ancient word that you spoke to Abraham is still being fulfilled 
and we bear witness to that. We thank you, Father, that you have, have continued to sustain us as your people and as a congregation and continue to work through us, and for that we are thankful. And Father, we, as we pray for our world, we, we remember those who are professing faith in places that it is very dangerous to do so. May they be strengthened and encouraged, and may your church, even those who, who worship this day in secrecy, may they be May they be emboldened with the hope that we have in Christ. May they be strengthened by the faith that they share with one another. We ask, Father, that you would intercede in many of the circumstances in which we see unfolding, and particularly that in the Ukraine right now, Father. We pray for peace. We pray for for a cessation of what may be saber-rattling or may not be. We ask that, that in these things your people would be protected and that they might act as peacemakers. And we pray, Father, that as you hold the hearts of rulers in your hand, that you would direct their, their thoughts and their course toward peaceable solutions. We ask, Father, that you would be with those that we have sent out into the world to proclaim the gospel. That they might have opportunity to share Christ this day and throughout this week. We pray, Father, for our world as we continue to face this pandemic. We ask that uh, as this virus seems, this outbreak seems to subside, that uh, it would continue to do so and that that with each and every one of these there might be growing immunity and that this pandemic might come to an end soon. We ask, Father, for Margaret that you would encourage and strengthen her as she deals with this situation with her eyes and that um, with each day that her hope in you and her, her reliance and faith in you might deepen. We pray for the comfort for for Donnie's friends, family, for Stillfather, for Jane, and for Phil, and Nani, and Addison. And we look to this future surgery for Suzette. We ask that you would strengthen her body and prepare her for that upcoming surgery. Father, we intercede for our rulers, for those who are over us in government, for our president and vice president, for our senators and representatives, for those who sit on the Supreme Court and on other courts throughout our land. We, we pray for our governor and our state representatives, for our county commissioners and for our city council members and mayor. We ask, Father, that you would give them wisdom that you would strengthen them in their faith that for those who do not know you that they might come to know Christ and for those who are wayward that you would bring them bring them back into the fold. And we ask Father that uh, they and their families might find encouragement and strength in you. And Father hear us now as we pray the words that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, remember this word. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace.